but the you know the book starts with the first human musicians were probably sapiens but maybe not who created flutes out of vulture bones and we don't know what we, they used them for but it is likely that they used them for like medium distance communication um and that over time you know just signaling from one hilltop to another the person who owned the flute would get pretty good at it and probably also use it for entertainment um and so that musician was someone who would make their flute develop a technique for playing their flute and use their flute and they would the entire musical supply chain would be one person as cities got more and more complicated as civilization got more complicated the instruments also got more complicated so you might think that if there's a universal law around you that uh, will make a big change to the world surely you should notice it and that it shouldn't just leap out of nowhere and surprise you uh, electromagnetism is a clear example of why this thinking is wrong so for centuries, millennia, we knew about lodestones, naturally occurring magnets, and we thought this was a curious phenomena. But we had no idea that the underlying cause of um, that magnetism, the electromagnetic force, was actually holding everything around us together. Right? It's as universal as anything we experience, but we just had no idea that we, had, we saw some tiny hint of it. What I'd like to talk about is well i really just wanted to share the thesis of my new book whose cover you can see here brighter my hope is that the book and its message can help um you know catalyze a new and more optimistic vision and and conversations about the future of the environment and why as the title of the book suggests uh it is in my view um so much brighter than so many of us realize um, now, if, if we don't plan and we, and we get blindsided by all of this and, and our policymakers are not informed ahead of time and the public is not pushing its elected representatives to make good policy, then that's just, we will simply fall into that trap as we have in the past. But knowing ahead of time and being forewarned and forearmed with that knowledge, maybe we can take a different course. Um, and I certainly argue that we ought to um, uh, think ahead and do precisely that in the book. I'm grateful also to be invited to talk here. It's my first time talking at MetaUni, which is a super cool venue. So uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited. Um, so to get things started, uh, the, the title of the talk is When Do Neurons Represent True? Now, I'm not really um, particularly only interested in when neurons represent true. In reality, I'm interested in when they represent anything, like uh, a face or you know, how a monkey might jump. Why linear logic? Uh, it's, it's the only place where I found any guidance on uh, on coming up with mappings from like, uh, let's say sufficiently cognitive looking things to vectors. Yeah, you said you learned geometric algebra out of necessity, or I think you said something along those lines. What do you use it for? I learned it, um, so the three people um, I named in the references, uh, Steve Gull, Anthony Lazenby, and Chris Doran, they were all in the same, all in <clears throat> the same group um, when I was uh, studying um, for my PhD, when I was working um, there, and so I was kind of immersed in it, and it was the natural language um, in which to do general relativity at the time. I was trying to measure how fast uh, certain black holes were spinning based on their X-ray spectra, uh, simulating their GOD6, uh, the, the photon trajectories nearby, you know, all those, um, the, the pictures which are now, well, even there are photographs, um, you know, or a photograph, right, in recent years um, of the very same thing, that kind of characteristic accretion disk type um, shape that you see. So you can do GR, um, you can do, um, I, what they argue, is that it's the most natural language for physics in general. I think it's pretty clear anecdotally, if we all just think to ourselves, but also empirically, when you go down sort of a neuroscience or psychology kind of viewpoint, there's so much research about how much better we feel and how much better our bodies respond to this kind of immersion in nature and wild things.
I think, you know, when you first、um, kind of suggested we go through Euclid, I was a little skeptical.、Um, I'm like, well, isn't that, isn't that some ancient book, right, that、uh, people don't read anymore? But、um, I got the same,、uh, I guess, impression as you as I was going through、uh, book one, at least, now we ask the question of why Euclid, right? I think it, it's, it's really,、um, it shows that you can do a lot with very little.、Uh, that's, that's, that's the first thing. And,、um, and it's kind of rigorous in a way that we, you know, as mathematicians are used to, but maybe people who are not mathematicians are, are not used to, right? And I think going through Euclid, you can get a taste of that without having to learn. You know, the kind of modern mathematics that looks very intimidating. You can still get the kind of satisfaction and clarity that, you know, we, we, we as mathematicians experience on、um, maybe not a daily basis, but, you know, sometimes you, you understand something, you're like, oh, that's, that's super cool.、Um, and I think、um, Euclid brings that to the masses. I ultimately want to learn an unknown property of a quantum system by interacting with it. This unknown property. It's going to be able to influence the quantum state, the, the st static thing、um, that we're interested in, but also the dynamic thing, the evolution of this state. This transition, you know, having this technology, leads to a lot of potential risks. Basically, my case for why this、uh, is potentially important is that、um, it's going to kind of shake civilization to the foundations in many different areas. Um, and very deep,、um, very deep to the foundations of how a civilization is built, the assumptions that where we organize our lives around.、Um, and I think、uh, coming through that transition,、uh, there are various pathways that could lead to really、uh, bad outcomes,、um, as bad as some kind of、um, dystopian future or even、uh, extinction of the human race. And depending on how bad the dystopia is, I guess one of these could be worse than the other, either way around. And today is going to be a standard math style talk. This is going to be the pop music of math talks. So I'm going to give you two stories and then I'm going to relate them to each other. So one of them is going to be the story of quantum error correction codes, and one of them is going to be the story of multiplicative linear logic. These are both systems that have、uh, some kind of dynamics associated to them, and I'm going to be relating these two dynamics together. So I'm going to give you two pieces of maths and then I'm going to relate them. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was saying. <laughs> All right, got it. Thank you. <laughs> of entanglement. Or、oh, they encode patterns of entanglement. I, I think R is fine. P proofs of patterns of entanglement. Thank you. Good. That's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. Because it, it's hard to argue that、uh, it's sort of. Uh, like furthering the well being of humanity to work on this now, if we could just like wait for AGI to do it and sort of work on AGI more to make it come sooner.、Um, like, so is it sort of mostly a artistic enjoyment thing for you? or? Well, I think that you have to sit down with yourself at some point and. Have a harder conversation with yourself and work out what your best chance at a meaningful contribution to the world is going to be. And it's not as linear as you make it sound. Like, AGI is going to benefit humanity greatly, and therefore everybody should work on it, is not good reasoning, I don't think. I think that those who have the skill and the passion and the opportunity and the talent should go for it. But I don't think that my most meaningful contribution could be to do that. Instead, the way that I could most positively、uh, give back to the world would be to work tirelessly on something that I genuinely see as special and important that I want to be,、um, that I can be passionately toward. So maybe this is not the fastest way to go about obtaining the theory, and maybe it's not even the most effective. but It seems to me like this is the most relevant way that I could provide a meaningful contribution.
because I think I'd be able to do as good a job work on AGI as I would be able to do here. So the rest of life after AGI has yet to be determined. And you know, I've got opinions on that as well. We're, we're going to have to shift our jobs into jobs that we want specifically human beings to do and then use that as leverage in order to get pay. That's my one line opinion on that. And maybe I'll do that at some point by turning this into an artistic endeavor that people want specifically a human to perform. But that's not the reason why I'm doing it at the moment. I'm doing it at the moment because I believe there's something there and I have an agnostic belief that math is meaningful and it leads to good things. So here I am. <laughs>